I don't know if I get up today. I don't know if I give one single today. My whole outlook is sunk in gray, and I have no idea why I woke up this way. Got my phone in my right hand, my books on the nightstand. If I unlock and I add pop, I'm stuck there. I'm a dead man. So Lord, give me this drink to please read one page. If it works in any way, I'll move on to the next thing. Oh dear, I got my socks on. I'm coming up. Welcome to Positively Undefeated. This is a podcast that talks about the day-to-day struggle ordinary people have over their demons and how each day they remain positively undefeated we share your ideas and ways that you can empower yourself to remain strong so that you can embrace the journey of living well thank you for being on dr Odeker. I, my aunt just sitting on to listen but we, i appreciate you taking time i know you're probably busy with this holidays coming up but thank you so mm-hmm. much for being on did uh is your office closed today or is it open today yes we are closed today yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I appreciate for you guys listening. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We, uh, we, if you haven't checked out our website yet, even one less.com is a great place to connect with us. And, you know, we have lots of resources. And so thank you guys for tuning in. Dr. Odekud, I wanted to, you know, thank you for also, uh, being, um, willing to serve on our board. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have, Number one, you know, um, the professional, um, you know, input and uh, medical input, and I appreciate that. But I, I just appreciate you being willing to serve. You're welcome. You're welcome, Doctor Odega. I wanted to ask about. So, what um, are you a general practitioner? Or do you have a specialty? No, I'm a general practitioner. Yeah. So mainly, it's. Um, and you out your office is in Midland, Texas. And so, yes, you know, I wanted to tell you, we talked about this a little bit before, but you know, I, what I've noticed since we've gone on this journey with, uh, you know, dealing with suicide awareness and dealing with mental health, I've noticed a group of, you know, a, a portion of those people, uh, are struggling with like chronic pain and, um, so, for example, even one of our board members, her daughter had gotten hurt like in June in, in junior high, uh, like at a sporting event, you know, one of the events she was doing. And really that that pain continued to, you know, just um, plague her. And and I've heard lots of stories since then about people dealing with, you know, like migraines is another example. Yeah. And so I would just like. It's not, you know, obviously they're not your patients and, and, you know, I don't, you know, it's hard to, if they're not right in front of, you, front of you to be able to talk about it. But I wanted to just get your thoughts on pain management, especially with the opioid crisis that you hear so much is that exactly, you know, too many people gave away, you know, it sounded like lots of mismanagement and, oh, you know, abuse of pain medicine, medication. Um, in light of those things, what what do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yes, of course, yes, of course. Like like you mentioned there, the the um, the problem with the uh, uh, pain um, management is like a complex. It's uh, it's a complex issue, really, deal to deal with. In the past, it was easier, uh, but but with the explosion of you know opioid and and uh, and suicide deaths or overdoses, it, the government really stepped in and uh, made it a little more difficult for the doctors. But really, in general, uh, what we practitioners do. Um, is to try to see, you know, what is causing the pain. Like you mentioned, I mean, it could be pain from an injury. Most of the times what we see are usually back pain. Back pain is a, is the majority of, of pain issues that we see. And a lot of times, you know, some of these are things that can be fixed or, you know, made better so that pain intensity is less and a little more tolerable with, you know, 
uh, regular medications. Um, so, so when patients actually come to us, we try to determine what the origin of the pain and and how you know we can help patients so they're not in that category where they're relying on you know pain medication uh, and all the problems that can go with it. And a lot of times there are you know these pain problems that can be fixed uh, or at least made better um, so that the person is not in you know severe pain all the time is is almost intolerable to be in severe pain all the time it really is i um i i'm always have been interested in the i mentioned migraines and i you know my my wife struggles with migraines and her daughter struggles with migraines and also part of that you know her daughter has struggled with some you know mental health stuff you know depression and and things like that and i've you know i've never had a migraine but i've i've noticed that it it's the strangest um problem because there seems to it seems to come out of nowhere um and yes i think that on you know onset early onset if you detect it then you might can take some medication that helps it from being as severe as it is have you dealt much with like migraines and, and how have you dealt with my mig- people that struggle with migraines? Yes, I've dealt a lot with migraines and I treat a whole spectrum of migraine uh, headaches in the office here. And the good thing is, you know, um, um, the science of migraine has evolved and gotten better over time that, you know, a lot of times we don't use pain medicines anymore for migraines because because we found out truly the kind of things that are causing it, you know, the chemical problems in the brain that can cause migraine. And then you target, you target that in particular. As long as, you know, when we see a patient with a headache, okay, we try to make sure it's not something more serious. It's not a, a tumor or something, you know, that needs, you know, operation or a different kind of treatment. The ones we established that it's migraine, yes, there are a whole array of treatments, medications that are used uh, uh, for migraines, especially if the, these newer ones, there are newer medicines now that actually work like magic, um, um, that actually helps without making someone feel tired or sleepy. You know, people working and, and in a meeting and start getting headache, they can just step out to their office, take the medicine, come back to their office and keep working. Before, medicines used to make you drowsy, make you sleepy, and once you take it, you have to go home and go sleep. But now, these newer ones for acute treatment, you take it, and within 30 minutes, you're fine. It's like nothing happened, and you're back again. And then people that are having these headaches more frequently, now people that are getting headache, you know, several times a month or in, in a few months. There are also medications that, you know, if people are willing to take it, uh, that can prevent those headaches from happening that frequent. Some of them are injections you do once a month or once every two weeks. And once you get on those injections, you can go six months or more without having any headache at all. And if you still get breakthrough headache, then these are the newer ones that I'm talking about. You can take and uh, and within within 30 minutes the headache is gone. Uh, so it's very manageable now. Uh, migraine headaches and not with narcotic pain medicines. Um, um, and like I said, the major problems we see with uh, with pain medicines have to do with you know things that the science is not well defined. Um, Things like fibromyalgia, you know, some types of arthritis that patient cannot take um, the kind of medications that are used for it, that are strong medicines. Then we are lost, you know, how to manage the patient. And and we know the patient is hurting, but, you know, you don't want to put them on strong narcotics uh, uh, all the time. So that's the problem we run into in certain types of uh, headache, some types of pain. But there are, there are, 
you know, problems that can cause headache or pain that are very, very manageable now and, and controllable. So people are not, you know, hurting with migraines all the time. I think that there's probably, I think the percentage is small, but you might have another opinion. But like I'm thinking there's a small percentage of people who are, you know, uh, pain medicine seeking. They want the pain medicine. But I, again, I believe it seems to me that percentage is small. And yet I think what I've heard from like many people that they're in the, maybe in this chronic pain, they go to a doctor or they go to, you know, a clinic and, and they almost look at them like they're drug abusers. And so then it's, it's like the stigma to the stigma that they, um, you know, are reluctant to ask for help because they don't want to be looked at like a drug addict or something. And, but I feel like that the percentage of people who actually are abusing um, is small. And, and that gives us hope that, you know, you can get help if you go to your physician and ask for, you know, that you're struggling with a migraine or fibromyalgia. And, and have you, what's your thoughts on that? I think, I think you're right. Um, um, and that's, you know, before it used to be worse, you know, doctors, you know, like me, general practitioners, um, we were able to write, you know, pain medicines anyhow, but with the state and the federal stepping in and monitoring doctors and how we write narcotic pain medicine and arresting doctors and putting doctors in jail that have been actually seen a doctor jailed for the way he was writing pain medicines, you know, without monitoring the patients. Um, um, with that, you know, the doctors are scared too. The doctors are, have to balance out, is this, you know, patient, you know, truly the type that is not going to abuse it or doesn't have the tendency to overdose on it. If a patient, you write pain medicine, overdoses on it. It comes back to the doctor. Why did you write this many pills for that patient? And, you know, doctors are people too. We can read people's mind sometimes what they're going to do with the medicine you write. So it really makes it difficult, especially patients that you really know they are truly hurting, you know, and and uh, you're not able to, you know, uh, help them. But if there are, you know, Ways you can treat that. Like for me, for me, you know, we follow guidelines. Like somebody has surgery and, um, and, you know, they need pain medicine for a short time, uh, until the, the surgical wound heals, you know, fine. We can give them pain medicine for a week or two until the pain goes away, you know? Um, but if, if the patient, you see the patient a month or two later, and they're still hurting from there, then something else, something else is wrong. But if it is a pain that can be fixed, like the back pain, and they need surgery, you know, uh, there are, you know, we'll refer them to, to the surgeons or to pain management, if they need shards or things like that in the spine, to try to see if the problem can be fixed in a better way than having to take medicine. Yeah. I think that another, it seems to me that, you know, we're not always honest with our physician. So we may go to the doctor and we say, well, this is going on, but we're not telling them maybe everything we're taking. We're not telling them that, you know, we're not being completely honest because we're afraid that, you know, they, um, they're, we're embarrassed maybe, or, you know, or we feel like we're getting trouble with the doctor, you know, or, you know. And yeah. I think that that honesty element has to be, you know, paramount that if you cannot be honest with your physician, then, then he can't properly, like you said, you're not a mind reader. And so, um, I, like, I always encourage people. It's like, you have to be honest with your physician and let them know really what's going on and what you're taking. And, you know, exactly. you're drinking a lot of alcohol to deal with pain, for example. Uh, and if you're not, truthful about what you're doing, then I, I think it really disables you where you're able to help completely. That is true. 
That is true. And, you know, the, the pain specialists are the ones, you know, better trained to deal with pain. And they have more leeway in what they can do, uh, even though, you know, some of them still get in trouble. But a lot of them do drug testing. You know, when when a patient that they have on pain medicine or pain patch comes, you know, they do a urine test uh, to make sure that, you know, they're not doing all the things uh, that can jeopardize their health when they get when they get pain medicine, you know, because this strong narcotics can interact very quickly with with you know illicit drugs and things like fentanyl that are very readily available. Now. That just a little bit of this and a little bit of that can actually uh, knock somebody out or, or knock their breathing center out. You know, so they they try to be they try to be really careful and being honest. Truly, you know, helps um, helps doctors to manage, you know, this this um pain problems. You know, I think that sometimes I s- I've also seen where, like, you ha- a person has a general practitioner that they go to when they're feeling sick or they're hurting or, you mm-hmm. know, or and then, you know, that same person, especially as you get older, you might go to a heart doctor. You might go to, if you have, you know, type 2 diabetes, maybe you're going to a specialist. Maybe, you know, there's multiple, as you get older, it seems like there's multiple specialists they may go to. And a lot of times they don't communicate well to the general practitioner that I've gone to see this specialist doctor and he's prescribed these medications. Yeah. Yeah. You know, have you seen a lot of that too? Yes. 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 We see, we see a lot of that all the time. And sometimes, you know, sometimes some patients don't do it, you know, uh, on purpose. Sometimes they just can't remember, you know, the names of their medicines or how many. You see, sometimes uh, one doctor writes one medicine and another doctor writes the same kind of medicine, you know. So we usually encourage people to bring bring the box of your medicine, the, all the bottles, bring it when you come, you know, so we see what what you're taking. And it's, it's really the general practitioner's job to figure that out because these specialists, when they go to the specialists, the specialists usually don't have time to ask them about other medicines they're taking. So we try to streamline that out so they don't we don't get in trouble with, you know, medication interaction especially in the elderly like you said yeah yeah well i you know i was blown away whenever you know because i've been in the nursing home business really for you know that held that part of healthcare for you know 20 something years and i was blown away because the average number of medications that a nursing home patient takes is 12 that's the average per day yeah. you know you start to realize is that a lot of the medications that they are on really are because you know they may take this one medication and it has side effects and so some of the medications are treating the side effects you know of another medication and so it's that like is true at that and you're like oh my goodness and what but what also you notice is like you know you have time and maybe specialists who've seen them and so they might have taken this one, prescribed this one medication for, you know, let's say, you know, cholesterol or something. And they mm-hmm. continually take it for, you know, how many ever years and nobody ever has looked at it again to say, do you still need to be on this medication? You know, how many ever years later? It's very interesting. That is true. You're right. You're right. It's actually the job of the, the general practitioner like myself to determine that, you know, when people come in, like for a checkup or something, you know, we we do encourage them to bring your medicines, uh, anything you are taking, but but over the counters too. Mm-hmm. It, it will be it will surprise you how many uh, medications people buy in the store or buy off the TV because of what what the advertisement says. And some of those things do interact with uh, with um, prescription medications, even though 
they say is herbal herbal medicine, but Supplement. it has chemical ingredient. Yes, it has chemical ingredient that can interact. So we encourage people, even those ones you buy in the store, bring it with you too. Let's make sure that you know this is what you should be taking. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I I want to ask you about when when I think that. I was going to ask your opinion about, do you think that there's like a spiritual side to, to even the, the medical, um, when you, when you see a patient, let's say they're depressed and, um, you know, yeah, a, a, a antidepressant might be, you know, completely, um, you know, useful at this time to help them get over that depression or help them through a, a, a time period. But I was curious in your opinion, does there also become a, a time in a patient's life where you feel like that the spiritual side of things makes as much sense as the medical side? There are times, you know, that I feel that way. Um, but, you know, everybody's different. Yeah. You know, you don't know who believes uh, what they believe, you know. and really. I try not to get into that uh, spiritual aspect because you don't know who you will offend and who doesn't, you know, um, really want to talk about those issues. But I, I do, I do ask people sometimes, you know, if they have a um, the spiritual guidance, you know, uh, some people, you know. Uh, go to church, some people don't, some people have uh, uh, pastors or, you know, imams or things like that. But yes, I do agree that there, there are some spiritual aspects of what people believe, you know, uh, that could be, you know, responsible for the kind of problems they're going through. But it is an area where um, it's difficult to address um, in the office. I, uh, why, Dr. Oka, why did you become a physician? I mean, what made you like, uh, choose this career field? <laughs> did it choose well, you? You chose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I made the decision when I was really young, when I was, when I was really like in, in grade school, actually, you know, um, it wasn't my parents or I didn't have anybody, you know, pushing me or something. Uh, and I didn't, you know, um, it wasn't like when I was an adult, I've, I, I've known people that are sick and, and I wanted to help people. Really, that, uh, that realization came later, later when I was already in school, you know, truthfully, when I was, when I was young in grade school, I just wanted to, you know, be a better student and compete, you know, with with other kids that are that are, you know, smart too. And and you know, you do something competitive. I was like and medicine appeared to be competitive, truthfully. But it was later when I was when I was already in medical school that I actually um found the the meaning, you know, to what I've been pursuing is really, um, really helping people, you know, because you don't know uh, what, what your position might be the next day. I could be the patient, you know, my kids have been patients. You, you, you don't know. So helping people and, and doing it, doing it, you know, with your heart truly is the passion of, uh, of being a, being a doctor, putting yourself in the position of the other person, you know, that, that, that you're trying to help, you know, that's, that is the, the joy of, uh, of practicing medicine for me, um, you know, now. Was your, what did your parents do for a uh, uh, career? Oh, well, my dad, my dad was in the construction business. It was the building contraction, building contraction. I'm originally from Nigeria. I actually grew up, grew up in Nigeria. So my dad was in the construction business and my mom was, was stay at home mom. 
Yeah, so m my dad didn't have a college degree. And like I said, you know, he, he didn't encourage me to become a doctor. Uh, it was something that I, I figured out in school with other kids that, uh, that were, you know, trying to be high achievers. Um, that was what led me in this path. Yeah, it seems, you know, if you, if you think about it like that path, I mean, there's so many, like, it's very interesting to me. And I think it's like inspirational to think about like you coming here to America and then being a doctor here and then uh, the number of people that you can help. And I mean, really, it sounds like if not, you're pretty close to the first person to graduate college, maybe in your family. And so... I, I think I just, that's pretty inspiring story, you know, to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Did, uh, so is, is your parents still alive now? No, but my parents have passed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I'm sure they were very proud of you and did, um, you know, so I want to kind of end it in what we're talking about. So if, if, if we have somebody listening, Dr. Uruku, who, who, is struggling with pain and, and they just constantly feel like that maybe it's for their kid. Like, like maybe they have a teenager and they're constantly trying to find answers. There's nothing more heartbreaking as a parent to see your child like struggling, hurting. And, you know, I, I can imagine like you'd be willing to try anything. Uh, what if somebody's listening and let's say their kid is struggling with you know, they've been hurt or they're dealing with pain. Um, and they feel like they've tried everything, but they're not getting any results. It's not helping. We definitely are not talking about somebody who's drug seeking. Um, what would be your advice to them? My advice to that person is truly to treat, you know, this pain as, as any other medical condition. Okay. Seek the help of of a trained physician, I like a primary care like me, stop, stop with someone like me that you trust, you know, uh, anywhere you are in Oklahoma, any city, you know, start there and seek their opinion, see what they will tell you. Um, uh, if there is a way medically that the pain can be handled, like I said, most pains, there are pathways to treating them. Okay. If it is something the primary care cannot treat, he will probably refer you to a back specialist or a pain, a pain physician that they trust. And that one, this is the step, you know, the step ladder way of treatment, you know. If it is like this migraine, if I can't handle the migraine myself, I refer you to a neurologist that, that I'm confident with. They have more training than me with treating something like a migraine. And that's how it should work. You know, the primary care sees you and he refers you out for things he cannot handle. So if you, if it is something like I have, I have a, a sister-in-law that has rheumatoid arthritis and she's in so much pain, you know, that it's not like it, like it, like a back pain where you go and do a shop and you think you hope that it will get there. Um, but you know that, that she's hurting. So in those cases where, you know, the problem is, is like all over the joints and, and it's not something that, you know, you can do surgery and fix, you may not have a choice, but to see the pain doctors that can give you pain medicine and they, they, they know that you're not abusing it and you're taking it as prescribed. Sometimes it, it ends up, you know, that way. But most cases uh, can be managed in a way that even if you need pain medicine, you will not be needing to take too many. You know, that can cause, that can cause problems. So the thing is getting the information right uh, to the physicians, the right physicians uh, that can help. Not a physician that will just, you know, throw pain medicine at you uh, and, and, you know, just, and that's all they can do. Some of the pain pain problems can be controlled, or at least ameliorated in some way or another. Sometimes you might just need physical therapy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, you know, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I think that, you know, like we talked about, I think that we have to make sure that we do you as a physician a good service by also, you know, being honest and talking about being being thorough and how we 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 talk about what we're taking, whether it be supplements or, you know, over the counter, as you mentioned. And then, you know, any other medication that I think those things matter, but also lifestyle matters too. You know, if you're, I think that it, those are important factors in, in being honest with your physician so he can have as much information to help you. And, you know, I think that sometimes we're not, like we said, we're not always honest because of embarrassment or whatever. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Odaku. I appreciate you taking the time. I know. You're a busy guy, and um, I hope you have a Merry Christmas, And um, but, but I appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. Thank you very much, bro. I hope you have a Merry Christmas, too, and your family. Thank you, Dr. Odeku. This is Debbie. Thank You're you. You're welcome, Debbie. Merry you Christmas. have a Merry Christmas. Thank you for the beautiful Christmas card as well. You're welcome. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you for listening to Positively Undefeated. If there was something in this show that resonated with you, please share the show with your community. If you want this show delivered each Monday morning to your podcast app of choice, please subscribe or follow. And if you'd like to get a hold of Burl, please do so by going to burlstricker.com forward slash contact.